The following is an EWTN special presentation. It's now uh, my uh, real honor to introduce to you Father Thomas Loya. Uh, Father Loya is a uh, uh, a priest and a pastor of the Assumption Byzantine Church in Illinois. Uh, he is a, a renowned expert in, in icons and in art and uh, has two radio programs that uh, he sponsors on these subjects and on Byzantine matters. Uh, so he's going to be talking to us today about praying from icons. Father Loya. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, isn't he the Byzantine Ukrainian bishop we gave the award to the other night? <laughs> yeah, he's often confused for me. <laughs> no, I am not Bishop Boris Gudziak. I am Father Thomas Loy, of course. However, he and I do share a common spiritual heritage. We both belong to the Byzantine Catholic Church, and to explain a little about what that is, real quickly, if you're not familiar with it, just watch my hands. Okay, this is all about art, imagery, right? Beauty. Okay, the church developed basically along two lines, an Eastern approach and a Western approach, so did civilization. But they were one for the first thousand years. In other words, as John Paul II said, the church breathes with both lungs, East and West. So it was like a marriage, like a relatively happy marriage for about a thousand years. Then there was a great schism, like a divorce, so they split. The Eastern churches began to call themselves the Orthodox churches, and in the West it began to be known, of course, as the Roman Catholic Church. Now, watch my thumb on my left hand. 500 years later, in the 15th and 16th centuries, parts of the East reunited, reconnected with Rome, and Rome with them. And that thumb, that's what I am. I said Bishop Boris is. This is what we call the Eastern Catholic Churches. Those churches are reunited with Rome and Rome with them starting in about the 15th and 16th century. So between my thumb and my right hand, that's the Catholic Church. 21 different ways to be Catholic. 21. I'm one of them, and you're probably another one. That's two. We've got 19 more to go. We've got Latin right, the Byzantine right, but hopefully one day they'll all be back together again. So your Pope is Pope Francis. My Pope is Pope Francis. Many of you were born and raised Roman Catholic or Latin right. I was born and raised Byzantine right. So, simple enough, 2,000 years of history in two minutes. But whether East or West, being Catholic, Orthodox Christian, really, is all about, really, not so much rules and teachings and so on, it's about seeing, seeing the invisible God, the ineffable, indescribable, infinite, immeasurable See, we Easterners, we like to say who God isn't more than who he is. Infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, ineffable God. Become visible through the physical. The invisible God become visible, tangible through the physical. And then to live according to that vision. It's an incarnational vision, an integrated vision. And it is the vision that iconography communicates to the world. In fact, immerses us into. Iconography is about a way of seeing. It's about the truth of life. It's about mystery. Mystery is about something revealed and something hidden all at the same time. Mystery is not something unreal. Mystery is what is most real. Mystery is about the incarnation and how that is revealed. In iconography, that image, that worldview, is presented through line and color. In the scripture, we have it through words on a page. In the art of iconography, it's through line and color. Or, for instance, mosaics. And we've talked a lot about beauty today, marvelous, profound talks today. Now, maybe we'll, we'll look at a little bit of beauty as <laughs> also. But in the Eastern churches, the approach is this. If you can watch my hands once again, 
The Eastern approach starts from God's transcendence, God's infinite, God's immeasurability. But that God, who is so far beyond us, so infinite, so inexpressible, we say in the Eastern Fathers, we'll say, that very God bent the heavens, came down to earth, became imminent. The transcendent one becomes imminent. He condescends in, condescends in a great self-emptying. And the genius of the East is to express everything that we believe. So everything is significant, every detail, especially the art. But the art is set in a context. Father Cameron this morning mentioned this word integrity or integration. It all works together. Let's see if this... So... If you take this action of a God who comes down to earth, a transcendent God who comes to earth, the incarnate God, so you've got heaven intersecting earth, the question is how do you express that through art and architecture? Well, this is what the Byzantines arrived at. If you take this motion, shape of an arch or a dome, so they use that motif, how do you then depict the world? They took a cube, because it's perfect, and it's four sides. Of course, the earth is round, but north, south, east, west, four corners. And they pushed the, them together. So you have a dome intersecting a cube. This is a picture of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. You see the dome structure coming down and intersecting a cube. Now, when that happens, you're going to get... Well, in contrast, I'll just make a little contrast to the West. In the Western approach, the Western approach, st the starting point was man as striving towards God. And so art expresses a soul of a people's. So in the Western art and architecture, what started to happen was, instead of the dome and arch, you began to have the great soaring verticality, the great Gothic motif. But when you put together, the, in the Eastern churches, you put together the dome with the cube, you get certain shapes, certain pendentives, and those shapes are going to be wedded with the architecture. You have to think integratedly that the architecture, it's as though it is made for the art. There's anatomy of a Byzantine church in a cross section. You can see the intersecting arches made by the fusion of a dome with cubes. But on the outside, what you would do is you'd get a hint of what is to come. Iconography would be placed on the outside of the church. So you get a hint of what is to come. But once you enter the church, there's been this explosion of color and light. Now, the icons and iconography did not use stained glass windows. It tended to use natural light. So it would strike the icons and the mosaics inside and kind of scintillate them and make this very, very mystical kind of explosion. The idea was you entered, you entered the church and as if you're entering another reality, heaven on earth. These, some of these pictures are the pictures of my own church, or some of my own, my own work, mural work. But you see the light shining through the round shafts, shafted windows, scintillating the icons. And every square inch of the church is painted, is colored with icons. Because the idea is that you're moving from heaven to earth. You're stepping into another reality. You're being caught up into something that is very, very other. You get a hint of it on the outside with the architecture and some of the icons. But when you walk into it, everything kind of moves you into this other dimension. The placement of icons in a church is very significant. The, they tend to go into this, in, 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 the importance tend to go in terms of size. So the largest icon, for instance, this one here, this is called the Christ Pantocrator, in other words, all-powerful ruler. This is about uh, 13 inches in diameter. It's about 13 inches in diameter between here and here. And the icon of the Pantocrator is the most looming icon in the Byzantine church. It's up in the central dome of the church. The idea is that this is the Christ, the all-powerful ruler, who is in heaven, surrounded by all the heavenly saints. In fact, that's actually one piece of a whole icon. That what, would else, what all would be around him would be the angels and uh, saints in heaven. It's like the heavenly liturgy. On the icon, though, every detail, as I mentioned, is purposeful. Christ is seen usually in a red and a blue, depicting his two natures of being human and being divine at the same time. Many, many symbolism, but we'll 
move on to another one. The second most important icon in the Byzantine architectural structure would be behind the altar. And that would be, it's called the Platitera. And that is called the virgin who is more spacious than the heavens. That's what Platitera means. That he, whom not even the universe could contain, was contained within the womb of a virgin, making her more spacious than the heavens. She's depicted in the red because her red means several things. First of all, her queenliness. Also, it's an earth color from which Christ gets his human nature. And also her purity. She'll always be depicted with three stars on her, depicting the fact that she was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ. There she is, Christ, presenting Christ as though from her womb, looking into the very center of her heart. And that's why she is prescribed to be painted in the church above what is the tabernacle. In the Eastern churches, the tabernacle is on the altar. And so she becomes then the mystical tabernacle, either side of her abbreviations, Mater Theo, the mother of God. In the Eastern liturgy, there's a rite of preparation of the gifts prior to the liturgy, and it happens on a table in the corner of the sanctuary, and above that, that table is depicted the icon of Christ, the bridegroom. Once again, the architecture and the art and the liturgy is all wedded. Why is that icon there? That icon is there. You can see it's called Christ, the bridegroom, and he's in the preparation period, preparing to become that bridegroom who will unite himself in the mystical marriage of the Eucharist on the nuptial bed of the altar. And so there you see him being stripped, being prepared to go to the cross. And that icon is to be placed on that place in the church because of the union, the integration of the art, the liturgy, and the iconography. Separating the nave from the sanctuary in Eastern churches is a iconostasis or icon screen with three sets of doors on it. The central door is called the royal doors. These are the deacon doors. The processions go from the inside there. The priest is there. The altar is behind here. These doors are open at certain parts of the liturgy. Only the ordained ministers will enter in and out of this, these doors. Processions, though, will take place in the side doors called the deacon's doors. So there will be processions from the sanctuary out into the church and then back in through the doors. But the iconostas is the setting for the icons. Now, what is the icon screen there for? I know all of you are too young to remember, but your church used to have communion rails that separated the sanctuary from the nave. But in our church, the icon screen goes to the, from floor to ceiling, and what it's doing is depicting this sense of mystery. Something is hidden, yet something revealed. You notice your way is blocked, because behind there is the Holy of Holies. And we're not there yet. We're not in heaven yet. We're in route there. Yet at the same time, heaven has come down to us. So the use of the icon adorning that screen, that wall, is telling us that heaven is coming towards us, that incarnational dimension. Yet at the same time, we're not in heaven yet. So there's that paradox or tension around which the whole liturgy revolves. So you've got the liturgy, the art, the architecture, again, in an integration. Iconography began, actually, in the earliest days from pagan art, which was used in the early catacombs. It was actually more naturalistic and eventually became much more symbolic. You can see some of the, this is a borrowing, really, of Roman art at the time. This is an early depiction of Christ in the catacombs. He's depicted as a young man, as the good shepherd. But you can see that the, the Roman style of art at the time. But eventually, that's going to give rise to a more linear more symmetrical, more flattened two-dimensional art, which eventually would give rise to the theology of iconography. This is an ancient painting of, actually it's an old painting of the, it's from Dury Europus, which is an area of Iraq, and this is going to give us a hint as to how iconography is going to develop, going to move away from that naturalism, as we saw in the more Roman paintings. And you're going to see right here, notice a couple of things. First of all, you've got a linear, very linear character, frontal poses, and drapery done with lines. And look also at the background. You notice in, in this background, the way this is done, and again, this is going to be the precursor of what's eventually going to be the style of iconography. You have a sense of dimensionlessness, and that's very significant for icons. That's why there are always two dimensions. Dimensionlessness. Are these figures here against the wall? Is that wall far away? Is it close? And then the use of the composition on the walls they would divide up the wall with a kind of a schema, with a narrative inside the schema, as you'll see in, in icon murals. 
And again, this is from the ancient art of the Middle East, some of it being pagan, later some of it being from the Jewish tradition. But here in Ravenna, you see the development now of a movement away from the naturalistic to the more schematic, with, again, the imagery of Christ still as a young man. So iconography is developing. Like all art, it develops. And eventually, it's theology as well. I want to make another contrast here. Do you see the art of Michelangelo? In the Western church, art went in different directions, whereas the Eastern church, it stayed with the schematic of iconography. And you notice what Michelangelo does here that's different than icons. It's uh, super sensual. It's almost like taking the human person and making them like, like superhuman, superman. But what's interesting about that approach, in contrast or in common to iconography, is that the, the thing that Michelangelo was striving for was in a sense, a similar point is iconography, and that is the eschatological, that which points beyond itself. Michelangelo took the human form and said, well, if it has been imbued with the incarnation and has been raised to a whole new level because of Christ's ascension to heaven, we have now a depiction of the human person as almost being superhuman. But he did it by using very, very naturalistic techniques the use of uh, what we call theatrical lighting, in other words, lighting from the outside that makes these great three-dimension, three-dimensional figures. Iconography, on the other hand, as we're going to see, it, it stayed with a more schematic, less naturalistic. There's a contrast to the two icons. There's Adam and Eve. These are two depictions of Adam and Eve, one in Western art, one in iconography. And the iconography stayed with the two-dimension because it said that the three-dimension is how we look at life here. And we're trying to depict or get an sense or an immersion into life as it is beyond. And so they pulled out that third dimension in contrast to like Western art and arrived at that eschatological by looking at and depicting bodies that seem to be usually covered with drapery, but not always. And their body, the, drape, the body underneath the drapes seems to almost be spiritualized, like in contrast to St. Michelangelo's where every bit of anatomy is seen. Again, he's making it super essential, superhuman to denote the redemption, the incarnation. And iconography, in contrast, de makes the body, in a sense, spiritualized, as if there's no body, yet there is a body beneath the garments. And it tends to not depict the fullness of the body, such as the genitalia, the gender, as in Michelangelo's work, but at the same time doesn't shy away from it entirely. And again, and not because there's any kind of shame or Manichaeanism in there, it's simply because it's moving our eye, it's trying to immerse us into that ultimate mystery of the eschaton, the person spiritualized, the person transfigured. As I mentioned, iconography is just loaded with symbolism and theology. It's basically a theology in color. If you take this icon of the incarnation, the nativity of, of Christ, a couple of things to, that are important here. First of all, composition. What the Byzantine artists did was they incorporated something that was, you've heard it today in some of the talks, some of the principles of beauty, and some of it was discovered early on by the ancients. It was a certain proportion, sometimes called the, known as the golden mean. And they would use that proportion in the icons, and composition was very, very significant. It was significant to communicating the theology. Usually two things are happening in an icon. There's a hieratic and a narrative. The hieratic is that part referring to Christ and the Mother of God, which is basically without a lot of motion. The narrative is everything else that goes on. You notice there's a lot of movement here. There's like angels moving, talking, singing. There's Joseph thinking. There's the nursemaids bathing the Christ child. There's the three uh, wise men. You have a, a movement in a narrative contrasted with the higher attic stillness because Christ, God, of course, is perfect, does not change, whereas we are always in flux, we're always changing. And so the icon by composition is uniting once again and always heaven and earth, heaven and earth, the seen and the unseen. And also what's happening in many icons, too, compositionally, if you look at it, sometimes when you squint at something, it, it's a little easier to see. There is a vertical axis through this by the mother of God, Christ in the center, the star lined up, and then the horizontal axis of the angel, lining up the angel's heads there. So if you look at it, kind of squint real hard, you'll see basically a cross composition in this entire composition. And why is that? Because this Christ child, who you notice is depicted not just as a little baby in swaddling clothes, but a child with a man's head 
in the clothes of burial wrappings in a sarcophagus, ushering us on right away to the real meaning of this Christ child, of this incarnation, that this Christ would be a man that would grow, suffer, die, and rise. And so we have the figure of the cross looming over the manger. In the icon of the crucifixion, again, some very interesting compositional things here. I just want you to notice how the movement, the rhythm of Christ's body, look at the rhythm of the arms and the chest, the anatomy. It's a rhythm and the movement, and look at that rhythm coming down the edge, the movement of the body, the abdomen, the stylized abdomen. This movement here is a movement that is depicting the Christ writhing in pain. And at the same time, there is a kind of a resignation to that. He does not die in the cross. Just, in other words, his face is not the face of death. It's the face of one who is asleep, like Adam. His body thrusts towards his mother of God, and the mother of God is gesturing towards him and to us in a kind of a sense of resignation. Sorrow in one hand, resignation in the other. So there's this beautiful kind of S-curve as he moves and slumps towards his mother. John is on the right, again, as part of the narrative, and what's happening is there's a, there's a built-in triangular composition to this figure. What iconography does is it moves our eye in a way that very, very good art moves us. It uses geometric patterns that causes our eye to move in a certain way so as to communicate to theology, give us a certain sense of what is going on. The icon of the Annunciation. Lots and lots of meaning here. Once again, we see the Mother of God with the three stars, her red mantle, and there's something interesting right here over her thigh. That's reminiscent of what we read about in the book of Ruth, chapter 3, where Ruth asked Boaz to put the corner of his cloak over her. It was a sense of belonging, of being espoused. Already what's happening here, the incarnation, the enunciation, this is the espousing of God to the mother of God, where she will become, of course, pregnant with the Christ child through the Holy Spirit. Here's the Holy Spirit slashing down here. So we have the entire spousal mystery here, the incarnational mystery right in this icon and partially depicted by this little detail right here. There she sits in what is to be a throne, a throne-like structure. In her left hand is a bowl, uh, uh, it's like a, um, it's yarn is what it is. It's a spool of yarn. The idea was that this was happening, this occurred to her when she was in a very natural moment in her life. She was knitting something, and the iconography says that she was knitting something in premonition of knowing she might have a child. So she's knitting away, and the angel comes and surprises her. You see her hand in that gesture of surprise. It's surprise and resignation all at the same time. Always in iconography, there's the fusion of two things. The next life and this life, Two different kinds of moments or emotions, acceptance, fear, and acceptance, resignation, rejection. And in fact, the Annunciation icon actually oftentimes is depicted in several scenes, several like, like frames that depict that whole drama between Mary and the angel. The icon of the Trinity, one of the most classic icons, one of the most revealing ones, shows so much about our theology, about what we believe. These are the three angels that were depicted by the, uh, the Rublev, the Russian iconographer. He's taking these three angels based on Genesis chapter 18. Because in iconography, you, can't, you don't paint the Holy Spirit or you don't paint God the Father. Although sometimes you see that. You paint only the Christ because he was the only one that was in flesh, incarnated. So how do you come up with the Trinity then? Well, Genesis 18, the foreshadowing of the Trinity. Abraham was visited by the angels, that I was visited by God. Now, these three angels are set in a composition. If you look at the kind of squint at it, it's circular, in a very circular pattern. Why circular? No beginning and no end. What has no beginning and no end? Well, look at their heads. Tilted in deference to one another. What is it saying? It's saying this is an eternal, eternal love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A God who is eternal, and an eternal love between the three. A God who is a union and communion of persons. In fact, you look at the center there, what does this look like? An altar with the Eucharist, see the chalice, the bread, the second person Trinity, Christ. But look real closely. I'm going to take this, follow the bouncing ball, I'm going to take the red ball, I'm going to go from the eyes of this angel, there's a horizontal axis visually, cross to the eye of that angel. So your eye is actually seeing this. You can squint at that, it'll be easier for you to see. Now watch what I'm going to do when I'm going to go down the contour of this angel. 
going to go up the contour of the next angel, what shape are you, are you seeing in the negative space? Yes, the Da Vinci Code, huh? <laughs> yes, so important to, to the artist, to the theology, was the idea of communion, that he put it in really, literally in the positive and negative aspects of this painting. In other words, on your conscious and subconscious. And notice how their feet come together. Notice the perspective also. What iconography does, it inverses the perspective. You know, we look down a railroad track, how the railroad, the lines of the railroad will, will converge as you look down, like come to a point, that's perspective. Well, what iconography does is it reverses that. Because what it's saying is that the icon opens our vision, opens our heart to the eternal, to the eternal truths. And so it will reverse the perspective and make things go wider as they move away from us rather than converge. And so we stand right in here. This is, our, this is us in here. Our vision is here, and it opens up to the truth of God. Okay, I don't have time for, um, but I'm going to skip to uh, just to show you an application of this view. Iconography, uh, tomorrow afternoon, by the way, I'm going to do more on how the icons are actually painted and more about what goes into them. Um, but this view, really, that the icons give us, I call, of course, the sacramental worldview. It's the truth of life. It's the Catholic worldview, the Eucharistic worldview. And that worldview is what changes the world. Not just beauty itself, but this view of the invisible made visible. As we apply that to every aspect of life, it changes those aspects of life. It influences those aspects of life, as they should. No matter what you want to talk about, human sexuality, the, the Holy Trinity is the icon or, or human sexuality is an icon of the very life of the Holy Trinity, as John Paul II writes about in his Theology of the Body. Vocations, the environment, stewardship, global politics, you name it. Anything approached with that sacramental worldview turns to gold. Without that view, it turns to garbage, as we're seeing in our world. This image, this view, this vision of iconography is essential we need icons. We need church art to be rediscovered in order for help, to help us to approach all things in life. And I'm going to just give you one more example to end here. In my church, my parish, we, when we came to build our church, there was a water movement that came to that property. It was a problem, according to the neighbors, and they tried everything to keep our church from being built there. We said to them, Oh, well, you don't understand something. We have a different vision of life. To us, water is not a problem. Water is a gift. So we're going to show you. And what we did was we took that property, which was, um, had a water problem on it. No one saw fit to, fit to fix. And we took the vision of the icon, the, the, what the iconography conveys. We took that vision and applied it to the environment. And this is what's happened. Now we've truly transformed the entire, not only our property, but the entire community. And now we're the big heroes. Now they've given us awards. Now environmental companies even come. To, they think I'm some kind of environmental genius. I'm just a priest, you know. They say, want to come and see your environmental plan, Father. We heard all about it. I want you to, to help us. In fact, they've asked me to speak for their environmental companies. I'm just a priest, you know. So I tell to them, you want to come and see our environmental plan? I'll tell you what you do. You come in my church. Oh, but Father, we're coming to see an environmental plan. I say, no, come in the church. So they come in the church, and they walk in. And they came to see this, but they walk in. And they see this. And I say to them, you see that? You like that? He says, well, that vision is what produced that outside that you came to see. Without this vision here, without these icons and the vision they communicate to us, what they immerse us in, you would not have what we did out there. And that's the power of beauty. That's the power of true art in the church, something that really needs to be rediscovered and regained as we've been hearing all day today by these great speakers. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much again, Father Thomas Loya. I think we feel like we just got an entire course in spiritual iconography. Um, I certainly learned a lot in doing that, especially about the sacramental world uh, vision and how we can make a lot of money off of that in environmental engineering. So uh, then, uh, thank you very, 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 very much.